If anyone has um, been to the AUT SOTL conference in, in February, this is a variation of that chat. Um, and a lot, of data set, a lot of the data set is the same. So um, sorry um, for those of you that may have seen some of this already. Okay. So I work at CLEAR. Um, and we work with academics around professional development, learning design, um, and also innovation and technology. And um, what's coming down the pipeline that might actually make lots of sense within the environment that we teach at the University of Auckland. Most of you will know this context and understand that we teach mostly at scale. Once you get to the higher levels, third year, fourth year, and above, you start to get to reasonable class sizes. But for the first couple of semesters, first couple of years, most students see you from this perspective. And we struggle to actually create personalized um, feedback to students, um, particularly the one in the red shirt who probably is doing Twitter. You know. Who, who knows what they're doing? Now, um, learning analytics, obviously a bit of a buzzword, um, and there's a lot of hype around it. And it has the potential to do a number of things. Address retention and progression issues, uh, improve communication and engagement, um, things like um, handling or managing or administering large class sizes, uh, informing your learning and teaching. The design of your learning and teaching can actually be informed by how students are engaging and learning analytics potentially tells us about that. And of course it also helps personalize and create um, adaptive systems that might actually push ch students or challenge them further than what you would normally do in a lecture scenario like this. Okay. At the University of Auckland we are only tentatively starting to play with these tools for these purposes. We don't have a lot of infrastructure to actually really leverage or take advantage of, of this at scale. And um, implementing outside of what I'm going to talk about is a whole other question that we're, we're starting to address within the Student Digital Journey program of work and the Student Analytics working group that kind of sits underneath that. So nothing better than starting a lecture with a definition. And the definition for learning analytics uh, was set out at the very first conference for learning analytics. And it's about the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their contexts. That's important. Learners and their contexts for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environment in which it occurs. So the, there's a big distinction here. Um, and I think it's a distinction that still we struggle to, um, to understand here at the University of Auckland. This is not academic analytics. We know a lot about students even before they enroll and set foot in the first class. That's descriptive analytics or academic analytics. And it tells you about the student's potential Learning analytics is about how they engage with your course, your activities, the things that you create, the designs that you um, present and, and teach within that semester. How are they engaging with that? And what does that data tell you? Yes, we know potential says a lot. Students with high potential who have done well previously are likely to do well in the future. But actually, when you get into it and you start looking at how they engage with the way that you design the course or the way you deliver, that's what learning analytics is about. Okay? And there is that distinction between academic and learning analytics. So um, after a definition, the next thing to do is chuck a Venn diagram at you. Um, and this is really about making sure that you know that learning analytics is not some easy packaged solution that requires one extra person to come on board in your faculty and help you figure it all out. It is a combination of um, pedagogical theories, 
it's a combination of learning designers, something to be mindful of as we go through a learning and teaching review, and data scientists, different people with different skill sets, different experiences, working together, and this is before you even get to the content experts who are teaching particular courses with, in particular deep degree programs. So there's a lot of people involved in thinking about this. And following up a Venn diagram with another Venn diagram, this is the community of inquiry model. Now this was created by um, Terry Anderson and, and Garrison and Archer back in 2001. And it, it's, it's about presence. It's around effective presence, cognitive presence, and teaching presence. Effective presence, uh, the, the red one, is around student engagement, social cohesion in the classroom, and are you creating environments where they actually start engaging with each other and supporting each other, and how are you supporting them? Cognitive presence is around the types of uh, assessments that you create, um, and are they challenging? Are they um, supportive of your graduate profile? And of course, there is teaching presence. Who are you in that classroom? How do you deliver? How do you design? And how do you provide support to students? The overlap, where it kind of turns to orange, there between effective and teaching, is around the kinds of social support and um, engagement that you have as a teacher with those students when they're working through your course. And the tool that I'm going to talk about is designed to focus on making sure that you're having meaningful, personalized communication with your student at scale. Okay? Because when you think about the perspective of a thousand plus students, how are you going to have a personalized conversation individually unless you start leveraging technology? Now, a bit of research. This one's a doozy, and I, if you haven't read this article, I would absolutely recommend it, particularly the learning designers in the, in the lecture theater. Um, this is absolute gold. This is a systematic analysis, um, a review of about 38 meta-analyses, and it walks through instructional variables that make a difference, okay? So Schneider and Preckle from 2017, um, not surprisingly, social interaction is the one category, instructional variable category, that has the highest proportion of variables with medium and large effect sizes. If any of you have read the work of John Hattie around feedback, personalized feedback, this correlates to what he's talking about with the meta-analysis that he's done. This paper actually talks through and provides Cohen D kind of effect sizes um, on things that you can do within your classroom that are more useful than other types of activities or assessments. It really is quite helpful and, and useful. And surprisingly, that, that teaching or instructor presence is one of the biggest, most effective variables. The tools that we're using and playing with at the University of Auckland um, started out as SRES. Some of you may have known this from University of Sydney. SRES was created by a couple of enterprising learning designers come academics. And about 2015, we started working with them and created a version, um, a collaborative version between us, Otago, and University of Sydney called SRES2. Um, we got some ACO money, limited amount of money from ACO Aotearoa to do that. Um, and about the same time, maybe a year later, University of Sydney and a whole lot of other universities in Australasia um, landed a very large Office of Learning and Teaching grant, um, which allowed them to start from scratch, rethinking based on all the feedback from SRES 1 and SRES 2, um, and they created um, OnTask which is what we're piloting currently, although we still have one course within science that uses um, SRES. Um, SRES, or on task, um, they are 
tools that allow you to personalize your communication at scale. Okay. And one of, the, one of the opportunities within personalizing communication um, to students is nudge theory. And this is, comes from Thaler and Sunstein from 2008. Um, it is a reasonably interesting book and some really interesting ideas about how you can provide effective messaging to students. And it's based on nudge theory. Um, I know the title of the next talk is Nudge Nudge. It's a different type of nudge. Okay? And this is one where you as a lecturer don't dictate or direct or tell students what they're supposed to be doing. You're giving them choices. Okay? You're saying, you know, given previous experience, we find students who engage in these behaviors tend to be a little bit more successful than those that don't. You're not telling them what they're doing. You're saying, here are the choices that you have to make as an adult. You're becoming a choice architect. And the technology, the on-task technology is pretty simple. Um, creating effective messages that provide choices to students in a personalized way is actually pro probably the most difficult um, process. We have quite a lot of large first-year student uh, undergraduate courses going um, from arts, business, education, and um, so forth. And we have 12 piloting this semester, of which about six are from business. Um, I'll skip through that. Here is an example of a message um, that's been given by an academic at this university. And underneath is the student reply. This is not unusual as a response. Um, students are craving, in your big lecture theaters, students are craving for this kind of feedback. And we spend an inordinate amount of time focusing on the students at risk and forgetting that there are a lot of students in there that would love that personal feedback and, and are, are very appreciative of it. So we've done some semi-structured interviews with staff and students. This is preliminary initial data that um, is still ongoing. Um, and we've asked a, a variety of questions of the lecturers that have been engaging and piloting, as well as student focus groups. As you can see, the numbers for students are quite short. Um, so we'll just talk about perceptions from students. But I want to give you some feedback. And I think you should see this. The thematic um, analysis of the uh, staff interviews point out about four interesting categories. Reaching out and building connections is something that staff see as really valuable. It's reflective practice about their teaching is also important. And they're gaining insight and awareness about the cohort of students that's in front of them. There's also unresolved issues, um, which include things like what's the university's um, policy on learning analytics and ethics? And um, how are we going to address issues like scope creep? From the outreach and connection, here is a voice of one of the lecturers. And another. What we find is about 15% of the students who receive a message will reply. Most of them will be saying thank you, which means that as an instructor you don't have to engage with it. Some will be questions, which require um, follow-up, which could add to workload, but it tends to be in the low percent uh, single digits. Um, from gaining actionable insight, um, the second theme,
and in terms of reflective practice, the third category. From the student perceptions, so from the limited number of students that we've interviewed, um, overwhelmingly receptive for the personalized messaging, the personalized communication. They do point out that you need to be transparent, and that's certainly what we tell our instructors to do. Right at the beginning, you just say, hey, I'm going to be writing personal emails to you about things, and we're going to be pulling data. Um, and, and using that to, to, for your benefit. I think it's very important to be transparent, but at the same time, you're sending personalized messages, and it, even though it is using mail merge technology and all sorts of stuff at the back end, you should be very transparent about what you're doing. Um, you do need to be careful about what is a student's ex expectation um, and achievement criteria versus the one that you as an instructor have. And finally, um, the students have pointed out that they want to make sure that there is equal access to any of the resources or follow-up support that you might be suggesting. With that, I will take questions from the audience. The instructor writes the messages, so, so but the instructor can write them ahead of time. So we have, um, for, uh, I'll give an example. So uh, Mark McConnell, who teaches within com commercial law, he's been working with the tool now for three semesters. And um, what he's been doing is identifying points in the semester when he wants to send these particular types of messages. He has an idea based on the design and where the assessments are, what roughly he's going to be focusing on within those messages. And he writes those messages ahead of time. Because from a marketing perspective, which is my specialty, mm -hmm. these type of things work the first time students receive it because they have never done before. But the moment that you standardize these answers, and then they, they, they I mean, people know that it's not for them, but that there is a system behind mm -hmm. them doing this. And then they, they completely lose meaning. Uh, uh, that, that's the, the, the typical idea of how you contact your consumers in a certain way. The moment mm -hmm. that it starts to feel that, oh, they just have a program that sends me birthday uh, uh, reminders, then it yeah. starts becoming annoying as opposed yeah. to. Yeah. So these aren't announcements. These are personalized messages. They do, re they do rely on the data that that student has created in, that, in how they've engaged with the course. So it's specific to the grades. It's specific to how the, the behaviors of how they're engaging with the material online or possibly on class. It's the, you, you, the data sets that we get are actually allowing you to filter and create a specific message for each of those students. And at the back end, yes, there's mail merge. And yes, plenty of smart students caught on to the fact that these are probably assisted by technology, but that message is coming from the lecturer because they wrote it, and it's also speaking specifically to the way that they're engaging with that course. Yes, I, you do have to be very careful about how you structure and write the messages because it's absolutely right. If it's too generic and it's not personalized, it loses all meaning. And in fact, once you step back and you start taking a look at some of the other tools that are out there, um, where they're written from student support services, somebody who's not standing in front of the lecture theater, they lose all value almost altogether. I'm actually on Mark's teaching team mm. in that course. Um, I've seen some of these responses. One of, one of the, the benefits of the system is that it picks up uh, students who would otherwise fall through the cracks, in other words, the Christian. Mm. At the very early stage, at the rest stage. So the student would get a message saying, uh, hey, I noticed that you, you missed your first assessment. Uh, you know, you, you might have been uh, sick or unwell, or there's maybe a reason for this, but I'm just, check, I'm just checking to see everything's okay. And the students very often reply back personally. They say, thank you very much for checking mm. up on me. And 
uh, yes, I, 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 had a, I, I had some incident, or I was, uh, I had a, uh, some other family circumstance, and that's why I wasn't able to do it. But I will try my best. I, I'll try to improve next time. Mm -hmm. So that init that initial thing it tells us yes, the student is still engaged in the course, so it has a positive effect. Now, of course, I don't know at the point it was made. Um, if this message is keep coming, at what point does the student then decide to yeah. expand? So I'm not sure how that works, but I'm presuming the system has been designed to moderate that event. Sort of that that comes down to the design of the course, and it comes down to the to working with a lecturer about, um, in the same way that you would temper or making, make sure that your assessments are, are, are um, set out at specific points in the semester, we certainly work with the staff who are piloting the tool and are saying, listen, every week is not a good use of the tool. Specific strategic points in the semester in preparation for them, preparing for a midterm or the final or some big assessment, giving a sense of where they are, what the behaviors they're, they're doing well or should continue trying to strive to do, that, that's where you do it. You don't do it weekly because then the value is lost. You're also potentially adding workload to your you already. Impact, yeah, design. you design, you purposely design for um, the best impact. It's, it's a fantastic, yeah. It's a fantastic question, and it's something that we haven't um, had to deal with yet. In, in, I'm thinking in, in this context, even all the other universities that are doing anything similar to this using on task, we're, it's mostly still in the piloting stage, but we are, th we are very mindful that in the same way that you probably think about um, bunching of assessments, bunching of messages like this. And do you need to have these be, um, particular messages for every single course in a first semester or first year? Or is it a strategic decision by the program coordinators? Which core courses will this, these uh, messages work? And maybe we don't necessarily need them in every single course. So there is a point where that's going to be a very important question and strategizing about how much is too much is? Well, I'm sure we'll probably get to that point with a policy. Yeah, I think. And time's up, but um, I got the time's up message. Any other questions? Chun. Yeah, yeah. The, the problem with the Canvas um, solution is it's, it's ring-fenced by what's in Canvas, but unfortunately learning happens outside of Canvas as well. Um, so gathering data that you might use with polling tools in class, um, uh, attendance, um, all, there's all sorts of data that the students create, not just in Canvas. And the Canvas solution is specific to what happens in Canvas. And and I don't think the university is going to be pushing data up to Canvas in order for us to get that picture. So we'd be pulling Canvas and adding it to all the other data that we have about the students. And that's where on task allows for more breadth of data to, to think about how you want to engage with those students. Thank you.